Hello, everybody, and welcome to the PEGX Podcast. Today, we're talking about the guidelines surrounding storing and transporting hazardous waste Class I explosives. Federal rules about storage and transport of Class I explosives are proliferated by at least three different agencies, the EPA, the DOT, and the ATF, that last one being the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. So what do you need to know? Class I hazardous waste explosives are any substances, articles, or devices that explode, either intentionally or by accident. Each is subcategorized into one of six divisions based upon the relative degree of danger it poses and the predominant kind of hazard it presents, destructive shockwave, fire hazard, and or projectile emission. The first three categories are the biggest and baddest. 1.1 is mass explosion hazards. Prime examples are rocket fuel and dynamite, each notorious because even a small spark will cause it to explode instantly with destructive force, ruining your whole day and especially that of anyone nearby. Other examples are nitroglycerin, mercury fulminate used in blasting caps, and certain kinds of fireworks. The group in 1.2 have projection hazards. These explosives are dangerous not only because they go boom in a big way, They can also emit shrapnel and other dangerous projectiles with explosive force. Obvious constituents of this category are most forms of ammunition and grenades, as well as some types of detonating fuses. 1.3, that's fire hazards. Polytechnic flash powders for fireworks are common examples here, as well as some liquid and solid propellants. Because in addition to other environmental offenses, they are a fire hazard. Another seemingly benign example is sodium picromate, used in hair dye to produce color inside hair fiber rather than just on top. Oh, yeah, and some rocket motors. The remaining four categories are only robust enough for minor disasters and therefore deemed not as dangerous. These include 1.4, package confined hazards. These culprits can explode, typically during transport, but the blasts are mostly confined to their packaging presenting a relatively smaller hazard than categories 1 through 3. Examples are signal flares and stress signals, ammo tracers, weapon cartridges, and of course, certain kinds of fireworks. 1.5 are insensitive substance hazards. This category is mostly occupied by blasting agents concocted of palleted ammonia nitrate in combination with fuel oil. They can explode, but you have to try really hard. 1.6 extremely insensitive substance hazard, even more benign than their category 1.5 counterparts that exhibit little probability of ignition in storage or transport. So what are the transportation requirements for class 1 hazmat explosives? The transportation of class 1 hazmat explosives is closely regulated, especially for materials in 1.1 through 1.3 categories, which are the most dangerous to life, limb, and treasure. For starters, your truck drivers are required to have paperwork that's easily accessible to all interested parties. These include written emergency instructions and a route prepared in advance of movement. A copy of the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulations, Part 397, should also be on board, which covers pertinent driving and parking rules. Among those pertinent driving and parking rules, Class 1 loads are severely restricted from some U.S. tunnels and bridges, if not completely verboten. Parked vehicles with Class 1 loads must be attended to at all times and cannot be within 300 feet of a bridge, tunnel, crowded place, or fire, the last of which we think should be rather intuitive, but not to digress. Then there's the issue of labeling. Labels are always diamond-shaped, and their size must adhere to international standards, measuring at least 4 inches by 4 inches, 100 millimeters, on each side, square on point. There are seven different flavors of Class I explosive labels. First up is plain vanilla, which merely reads Explosives 1. The rest conform to the six subcategories, Explosive 1.1, Explosive 1.2, Explosive 1.3, and so on, which curious civilians will undoubtedly Google as they tailgate the truck posing its own ironic hazard. And there's also the issue of compatibility. Some substances that are relatively benign in isolation become predisposed to violence when close to one another. For example, copper sulfide and cadmium chlorate explode in close proximity, so you don't want to load a few tons of each on the back of a semi. Ditto for hydrogen peroxide and iron sulfide, which don't cotton to being together up close and personal. 
Something else to consider. Chemical groups react with other groups. For example, oxidizers, of course, give off oxygen, making the ambient air more supportive of combustion. Thus, loading flammable materials nearby is asking for trouble, and you don't want trouble. We're fond of reminding our listeners you should get expert advice before proceeding. The storage requirements for Class I hazmat explosives follow. Rules for storing explosives are mostly written and enforced by the ATF. If you go to their website, atf.gov forward slash explosives forward slash explosive storage requirements, you'll be further directed to the Federal Explosives Regulations at 27 CRF Part 555 Subpart K. It provides specific construction requirements for your explosive magazine, which is the place wherein ammo or other explosives must be stored. All that said, it behooves us to mention your hazardous waste experts prepared this podcast as a first step to familiarize you with the many requirements of storing and transporting Class I explosives. It should not be used as a substitute for reading and understand current federal, state, and local requirements. As in all things concerning hazardous waste management, expert advice is crucial, and the lack of it could be dangerous. But to continue, there are five kinds of magazines. Type 1 are permanent structures. Type 2 are mobile and portable structures. Type 3 are portable structures for temporary storage, known as day boxes. Type 4 are for low explosives, which tend to burn but not explode per se. Type 5 are reserved for storage of blasting agents. All explosive materials must be kept in locked magazines meeting the standards mandated under subpart K unless they are, quote, in the process of manufacture, being physically handled in the operating process of a licensee or user, being used, being transported to a place of storage or use by licensee or by a person who has lawfully acquired explosive materials under Section 555.106. Other requirements for magazines include, but aren't limited to, They must be sighted at specified minimum distances from inhabited buildings, public highways, passenger railways, and other magazines. They must be inspected every seven days. Permanent outdoor magazines must have a substantial foundation or be metal skirted to prevent access underneath the magazine. Explosive materials may not be left unattended in Type 3 magazines, including day boxes, and must be removed to Type 1 or Type 2 magazines for unattended storage. So in conclusion, it's no surprise the EPA isn't amused by large explosions, neither is the DOT nor the ATF. If people get hurt, there will be the consequent media circus and local, state, and federal prosecutors will be competing among themselves to indict you on a boatload of charges, likely to include criminal negligence. And as to involuntary manslaughter, eh, let's not go there. As in all things regarding hazardous waste, it's crucial to get expert advice, and even more so when it comes to things that explode. If you need help, contact us. You can find us online at hazardouswasteexperts.com. Thanks for listening.